My name is Chris Hawkins. I'm here from Thurston County Public Health and Social Services. Um, I do a variety of education and outreach programs um, where we do uh, prevention activities mostly, um, trying to encourage people to um, do healthier things for themselves, be more physically active, eat healthier, avoid exposures to toxics and uh, secondhand smoke and, and related uh, hazards in the community. And uh, I'm joined today by Duncan Green from Inner City Transit. And um, we're going to talk to you a bit about bikeable and walkable. It was titled Bikeable and Walkable Olympia, but it's really about the, the region as a whole, not just Olympia. Um, and uh, so we're going we're gonna to start off with some, um, just a quick rundown of some of the benefits of active transportation. And then I'll turn things over to Duncan to talk with you about uh, biking, how to prepare yourself to be using your, your bicycle for transportation. And then we'll come back to walking uh, at the, in the latter part of the, of the workshop um, and talk about some of the, the ways that we can support more walking and walkability here in our community. So to start off with, um, active transportation, which is walking, bicycling, um, and including using transit because that supports people in being more active in their daily lives, uh, has a number of benefits to us as a community. Um, foremost in my mind coming from public health are some of the health benefits, increased levels of physical activity. Um, if we are designing our communities in a way to support people in active transportation, we're minimizing injuries. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we get into some of the design elements of that. We're also cutting down on some of the things that threaten people's respiratory health and long-term health uh, in terms of emissions. So uh, emissions from motor vehicles put a lot of things into our air that are, that are quite unhealthy for us and contribute to things like asthma and lung disease and, and cancers. Um, we're here today to talk about the reduced climate impacts that come from active transportation. So those air pollutant emissions that affect our health, so the same process produces the, the greenhouse gases that contribute mightily to climate change. And so when we reduce those, uh, those emissions, we're lessening climate change. We're doing our best to prevent climate change. In the process, we're also avoiding a whole host of impacts from climate change as we do that in the long run. So there are a number of health impacts that come from, from climate change. Um, uh, increased, increase of certain disease vectors in our region is anticipated as the climate warms. Uh, we're anticipating that summers become longer and drier, which might sound like a great thing, um, but that contributes to drought and contributes to increased risk for forest fires. And so there's particulate emissions that come from that that threaten our health. And then in the wintertime, there's anticipated to be more intense storm events in our region. Um, so think of you know heavier heavier rain fall in shorter bursts. What that contributes to is flooding. So there's a whole host of health impacts and community impacts that come from climate change that we're concerned about at public health. Working to reduce and prevent climate change obviously helps to reduce and prevent some of those other impacts. Uh, and then there's a whole host of social benefits that come from uh, active transportation. Uh, we create a more inviting environment for people to be out and interacting. Uh, that in increases social cohesion in our communities. We're also probably designing our communities better for a range of abilities when we design for uh, walkability and bikeability. So we're making it possible for more people to be mobile, not just those who are able to drive. So that universal mobility is an equity benefit. And then there are a bunch of economic benefits from active transportation. Um, the Increased mobility for people is an example of that, but also it's a lower cost form of transportation to be out biking and walking um, and using transit. So people save money. It's more money for other things. Um, if we design our communities really well, they become very attractive to people and become uh, tourist destinations. So that's another benefit of uh, walkable, bikeable design. And we use our land more efficiently when we build, and I'll talk more about the sort of community design, land use aspects of walkability. Um, but we're making better use of our land, more development in a compact area. That is a way to increase development potential in certain areas um, and set aside land that is better used for other purposes. So that's economically efficient. 
And then there's a whole host of environmental benefits. If we care about water quality, we care about air quality, we care about various dimensions of quality of life. Walkability, bikeability contributes to that, those things, more so than a system that's built around moving large, heavy vehicles. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Duncan for some practical information about how to engage in bicycle transportation. So, um, because I'm really more about the practical end of things and just the movement of myself and others, I thought maybe I'd ask you guys to just get up and move around for a second and we can kind of get to know each other in that way a little bit and also um, kind of inform me about what your actual interest in is. So um, if you don't mind, just join me in the middle of the room here for a second. Audience participation. We'll, we'll keep it to a minimum so, you know, you don't actually. Um, so what I want to do is make a, a line of us. I'm going to line up and at the bright end of the room um, would be people who know everything about getting around by bicycle and do it all the time. So at that end. <laughs> and at that end, we're going to do this just twice, two different, two different continuums. So, if, uh, sure, you can talk. <laughs> um, so, like, if you really, if you ride your bike all the time, kind of that end. If you maybe never gotten around by bike as a means of transportation, go over there. Um, well, I better go over here because I do it all the time. Um, and. Cool, so now we know a little bit about where we're coming from. The next thing I guess I would ask um, would be, what's your interest in this particular workshop? Are you here more to kind of learn about the theoretical aspects of, you know, like what can be done, as Chris was talking about, in terms of uh, building infrastructure and advocating and things like that? Um, and that would be at this end. And at the other end would be, I want to learn like how to get around on my bike, practical nuts and bolts, how to do it. Like I've never done it before, I want to try it myself, and that is at that end. So, um, <laughs> okay, so that that um, is interesting. Tells me a lot about what you guys are actually in this room for, which is not so much about actually getting on a bike yourself and riding around. Is that true? Um, um, so uh, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> well, I would say that, you know, I, I, I don't do near as much biking as this guy does, but it's interesting when you start thinking about the logistics of actually doing more than just going on rails and trails and stuff, it's a whole, a whole other ball game about how do you get around safely. And that, that's part of my concern with it, but biking more. Sure. So um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that. So um, you're free to sit down if you like. Um, you can also stand or move around, that's fine. Um, that, that throws a little bit of a wrench in the gears for, for me, but uh, <laughs> that's all right, we can work with that. Um, so, Maybe we would start by talking a little bit about um, the perception of how safe or not safe it is to ride your bike to get around um, in our community. Um, and the reality um, that it's, life is risky and moving from A to B is risky. Um, really no matter how you do it. Um, so, and I'm not sure if this really addresses most of your concerns, but at least you mentioned it. So, um, bicycling to get around is um, a lot actually less risky than you may think. Um, and I wish I had brought this slide, um, but I recently came across a list of um, statistical likelihood of what you're gonna die from. Um, and the top of the list is heart disease. And not too far down the list is um, being involved in an 
auto accident. Um, and quite a ways farther down the list is being struck by lightning. And the next thing below being struck by lightning is being killed in a bicycle accident. So um, it's just statistically speaking with, you know, and you have to figure this takes into account the number of people who drive versus the number of people who ride their bikes. But uh, <laughs> yes, and the people who have hearts, right. So um, the, the cool thing about active transportation, whether it's biking or walking, um, is that it's good for your heart. Um, so there are risks involved in any means of transportation. And um, if you are informed and ride your bike in a safer manner, um, your chances of getting where you're going are actually a lot better than you might think. Um, and yeah, could actually be not that much more dangerous than riding in a car. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of, of vulnerability. Um, if you do get hit by a car, it's bad. Um, and, um, but there are things you can do to prevent that. And that, um, in, you know, I mean, one of the things that I was going to talk about in terms of uh, biking safety and etiquette, that's on the list up there, is that. Um, when you're riding a bike on the roads, um, you are, are legally a vehicle on the road. And you have all the same rights and the same responsibilities as every other vehicle on the road. Um, which means, yes, you do have to stop at stop signs and wait for the light to turn green and all that, um, you know, sort of things that might make you impatient. And you might think, you know, I'm just on a bike. I can just cruise through. but. It also means that um, you belong. You belong on the road, and um, you know there's truth and reality about like legally. Yes, you belong, and in reality, a lot of people in cars don't believe that. Don't think so. Um, but if you ride predictably and according to the rules of the road, um, you're. Uh, people will respect you for the most part. Um, and especially in our community, which is um, in terms of the built environment, not the most bike friendly, um, but it's pretty good. We have a lot of bike lanes and bike paths and a pretty bike friendly driving populace. Um, I ride my bike almost everywhere I go. I do have a car, but I uh, drive it maybe once every couple of weeks um, when I need to carry something large or go to a place where there's no transit available and it's far. Um, and I've had relatively few um, close calls and relatively few, you know, bad interactions with people in cars. Um, it does happen, but um, it's, it's not that bad. Um, if you are riding safely and according to the rules, and if you make yourself visible and ride in a straight line, um, people, you know, people will respect you for the most part. Um, Knowing how to get where you're going is also really helpful. Um, if you, you know, can figure it out ahead of time, figure out your route so that you're not like wavering at a corner trying to decide which way to go. Um, that's that's helpful too, um, both for your own peace of mind and just for you know being able to be confident and decisive on the road. Um, and having a, a bailout plan, meaning um, somebody that you could call to pick you up if you have a flat tire or you know the weather changes and you're not prepared, or um, those kinds of things can um, make make the whole prospect a little you know less daunting. Um, and um, one thing that's really convenient in many parts of the county, not all, but um, Many parts of the county are served by inner city transit. Um, every 
bus, every fixed route inner city transit bus has a bike rack for two bikes on the front of it. Um, and sometime in the not too distant future, that's going to be a, for three bikes. Um, so we're move, getting more capacity to move bikes on buses. Have you encountered situations where you wanted to take transit and the bikes uh, were already full? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with only two, it seems like. It's yeah, I mean, it does. They do. They can fill up on certain routes, especially. Um, and there are tricks, you know, like it, it doesn't always work, just depending on where you're going. But if you're, you know, if you're starting. Your, tr your trip on the bus somewhere near the origin of that trip. Um, it's worth just going to the transit center and getting there a little early and getting your bike on first. Um, and, you know, I mean, sometimes it'll be full and you'll just have to bike or wait for the next bus. Um, but that is, um, and is an option. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's just an infinite number of ways to combine biking with other modes. So, um, you can bike to the Amtrak station in Yelm and roll your bike on to the baggage car for five bucks and take your bike anywhere in the country almost. Um, and you can put your bike on the front of uh, inner city transit bus that takes you, you know, to the 512 park and ride and then you can get on the sound transit bus. You, you know, you can, um, all of the inner city transit's van pool vans are bike rack adaptable. You know, um, if if you were in a member of a van pool, you can take your bike on the van. Um, I mean, even if you're just trying to shorten your, the amount that you're driving, um, if you live far out in the county but and you work in town or you need errands in town or something like that, you can drive to a park and ride and then, you know, with your bike on your car and then bike around the you know, the stop and go parts of your trip in the more urban area. So there's just a lot of different ways um, that you can use your bike without necessarily having it be your sole means of transportation if that is, you know, a barrier. Um, <clears throat> so, oh yeah? I just wondered if there's been any talk about updating one bus away so that you could get on your smartphone and find out ahead of time whether the bike racks on it. Okay. <laughs> That is an awesome idea that I think you may be the first one to have thought of. Um, that would be that would be pretty cool. Um, a technological feat that I'm not sure I would under be able to conceive how how you would do that. But um, uh, yeah, that I'll, I'll remember that. Um, uh, so I don't. I, I if you guys are actually really here more to. Um, talk and learn about advocacy or um, structural elements of design and community building. Um, and it's not that likely that you're actually going to like ride your own bike to get around. Maybe we could, I don't know, Chris, can you like help me out a little bit on that? Or, or is that true? Do you guys have any yeah, questions? I can that, tell you that, my questions. Yeah. That would help. Uh, yeah. Why don't, yeah. If you have I'd questions for. I love pictures of the bike infrastructure in Amsterdam. And I wonder why it's so slow for the city of Olympia to get from where we are to something a lot more like that. And I'm interested in the politics of increasing, of kind of denser urban design and what's happening about the missing middle in Olympia. And whatever thoughts you have about the sort of complicated politics of trying to densify our urban areas. Yeah, that's a... That's, that's, that's what's on my mind. <laughs> yeah. Else in the room. And that's, that's a big... Question and Chris, I'm and sure I'm can weigh in on that. And I'm interested in why intercity transit is going to go back to all diesel buses. Uh, I I might I might be able to speak to that. Um, I'm I work for intercity transit. My gig is bikes, um, so I don't really know all that much about the buses. But what I remember hearing in the past about the diesel electric hybrids that we have is that they're actually not that much more efficient than an all diesel. Um, and the conversation is percolating from some of the board into this, you know, thinking about all electric buses. Um, but we've tried those, tested them, and like basically they can't get up Courthouse Hill. Um, you wouldn't have to so, drive. You wouldn't have to have every bus be capable of going up true. the Courthouse. True. So you know, like I said, I just I'm, run them on a couple of routes where they were functional. Right. So there's the, all. All I can really say is that these things are, they're not 
foreign ideas to inner city transit, and that um, so we're, you know these things are being researched and um, talked about, and you know as much as I would like an all electric fleet, um, there are still like some technological hurdles and just practical and expense and all these kinds of things that um, you know make those kinds of changes happen slowly, unfortunately, but. Um, and I probably should just stop talking about that <laughs> because I'm not a spokesman for that that part. Um, but just just so you know, you know it's it's in the in the mix of possibilities. Um, yeah. Before you turn over to Chris uh, on that sort of the advocacy question part of this question, I was thinking more also about you know when I was a couple of years younger and I was a student in high school and college, I rode my bike everywhere. And in those kinds of communities, there are lots, usually lots of places to park your bike and lock it up kind of safely. And around here, I, I see a lot of telephone poles and bikes, you know, somehow trying to chain to them and parking meters and stuff like that. And I'm kind of wondering, you guys that bike all the time, you know, what do you do with your bike when you go to these places, you know, where there aren't you know, safe places to sort of moor your bike while you're in the shop or doing whatever you're doing? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a good question. Um, and you just, you get really good at looking for, you know, you get opportunistic and you get the right, you know, you have the eyes to see, you know, like, well, that, I know my U-lock will go around that tree. Um, or, you know, my cable will go around the tree and my U-lock can go between the frame and the front wheel or something like that. Um, so, um, you know, if you're in Olympia, more especially in the downtown area, there are quite a few bike racks. Um, uh, City of Olympia um, will put in a, a staple in front of your business for the asking in downtown Olympia. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, personally, I kind of tend to go the places where I can lock my bike. So the fact that my bike is my means of transportation does kind of inform a little bit where I shop. Um, and so, you know, I don't go to the mall and, it, you know, I just don't, I, there's no place to lock your bike or, you know, and it's like you have to ride through bike unfriendly territory to get there. So, um, you know, I choose where I go based on my means of transportation to some degree. Yeah. Well, I have to admit, when I was younger, I used to carry like a, I think it was about a 20 pound chain and a huge lock. You know, but I, I carry my weight different places now, so I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> also, uh, one time I went to a restaurant where they had no bike uh, locks in, around it, so we just asked it inside, can we keep it inside if you don't have anything outside? And they said, sure. So sometimes, I mean, if there's nothing outside, it's the fault of the business, not you. Yeah. Um, so just yeah, inquire them, friend. what yeah. did they expect for you to do? And sometimes they will be friendly, sometimes yeah. maybe not. So yeah, talk to them so they're aware that there's also bicyclists that use your business. Good point. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I'm interested in advocacy as well, like you are, but from a slightly different angle. So I'm in Whidbey Island, Island County up there. So we're pushing to try and make bikes be accessible throughout the island. Well, the current approach is to uh, separate cars and bikes. So get separate paths for uh, the bicycles. Well, that's all great. However, it's prohibitively expensive, and it certainly won't happen in my lifetime. So I'm from the old days when we used to ride on the streets with the cars. And I, I think cars and drivers are much more conscious now than they were back in the day. And, and I'm, I'm just kind of curious if any other communities are realizing the practicalities and the expense of trying to achieve it in method A as opposed to <clears throat> kind of let bikes and cars mingle on the streets and educate the drivers. And But the ideal situ situation, I think, would be years ago, the Washington State Legislature tried to pass a law that required a, a three-foot horizontal separation between cars and bikes. To me, that would solve the whole problem, but it didn't pass. Yeah. Some other states have it, actually. Yeah, quite a few states have the three-foot law. So right I was just kind of curious if Olympia is... You mean as a driver, the, as you're coming up on a bike? If you're, yeah, when you're in yeah. a car and you're yeah, passing a bike. Feet, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. If you're a biker and you're in a car, you're a hell of a lot more thoughtful about it. Yeah. Well, I actually saw something recently in my, you know, in my searches that um, uh, there was a study that showed that people who ride bikes are actually measurably better drivers 
not just in terms of paying attention to you know, bikes and people on the street, but they actually process information differently. Um, so it, it, it takes different um, level of information processing in your brain to ride a bike. Um, and so if you have that developed, um, it, it makes you a better driver. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of a tangent, but when you're in a car, it just kind of seems like a screen. Yeah. Um, it's like <laughs> it's this video game you're right. driving. And when you're in a bike, it's, it's, real. Like it's right, it's right <laughs> in your face. You're about to get hit any moment. No, not really. Yeah, <laughs> but, you know. But, yeah. No, um, it's real. You could get hit any moment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, don't mean to scare any of you. Right. No, no. It is. <laughs> it's also true. If you if you run into something on your bike that you might have been able to avoid, you feel you're okay. going to get hurt. You know, like little kids don't yeah. usually ride in straight lines. I have found. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff like that. You don't know what they're going to do in front of you. So a couple of folks' questions have been more yeah. about the how do we create that more supportive community environment that makes it possible for. A larger proportion of the population, because let's be honest, it's usually less than 10% who are out there utilizing a bike or even walking for their daily transportation. Um, to make it possible for a greater proportion to, to do that, take some changes. Um, and as Thad was getting at with his question, um, it depends a lot on political will and, and policy decisions um, as to whether that that transformation is happening. Um, but there, there is also sort of the, the incremental change that comes from there having been already some steady advocacy in our communities. Um, and so specifically about um, bicycle supportiveness of, of Olympia, and I think rubbing off on some of the surrounding communities now, um, has resulted in a, in a pretty robust uh, bicycle facility um, system that is on street in our community. So probably 25, 30 years ago, there weren't any bike lanes in Olympia. And now um, it's a fairly complete system on major streets. Um, we happen to have the public works director from the city of Olympia with us here today, Rich Hoy. Um, so uh, Rich, feel free to, to, to jump in here. Um, but before he was became the public works director, Rich was uh, a volunteer on the city's bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee. So there's sort of a steady transformation going on within the city of Olympia to try to do more to support walking and bicycling, um, and the bike facilities that we see in bike lanes are, are an example of that. Um, another change that's been happening to address the question you were asking, Dave, um, what about end of trip facilities? That's certainly an important factor in whether somebody <coughs> decides to ride or not, that do they know, know that they're going to arrive at a place where they can be safe and secure in terms of parking their bike or just personal safety and security. Mm -hmm. and, and I think City of Olympia is improving on that. Uh, there was a period of time when um, there was a fairly weak requirement about whether bike parking is built when new construction occurs, and there now is a something in the development code for the city of Olympia that says you will provide bicycle parking, um, and it will be in proportion to the number of employees or the square footage of your building when you build it. Um, and you're supposed to provide both class one parking, which is covered and indoors, um, so very secure for your employees, as well as customer parking. So, and it has to meet certain characteristics that really support the bike, unlike mm -hmm. some bike racks that you may be familiar with from your childhood or even, <laughs> even more recently that don't support the bike very well and so the bike flops over and isn't very well secured right. from theft either. Um, so there's a steady improvement going on in terms of the availability of that parking because that code is in place. Mm -hmm. And the city, I think, is doing a fairly good job of monitoring how well that code is being applied when new construction happens. And it seems but like that's been the result in part by there being some advocacy right. out there in the community. Um, so with these new downtown apartments and condos going in, do they have parking for they, residents? They should, yeah. if they are being built to the code of the okay, city. So we can check it. <laughs> um, I don't think anyone's done quite inventory of the, the latest buildings that have gone in. Um, oh, so interesting. I think if you look around <coughs> these buildings, you tend to find that there is some outdoor parking for visitors. And, and there's probably some indoor parking for the residents of those buildings. And so there's a standard for commercial versus residential and that sort of thing. So that really was a result of, of some long-term advocacy on the part of some local organizations, Capital Bicycling Club, and, um, and also an organization called Olympia Safe Streets that have really been dogging that and making sure that the city does make those changes to their code and then apply the code and ensure compliance with the code. 
So I think some of those changes are happening. The bigger changes that Pat was referring to of, of land use and how we achieve walkability, I probably should get into my presentation so you can learn, everyone can learn a little bit more about that, um, what it takes to support people walking and bicycling in their daily lives. Um, but I think you had another question over here. Well, I, just a quick comment, Chris, um, and this is responding more to the gentleman's comments uh, from Woody Allen, that um, uh, in our planning for bicycle facilities, it's really evolved as we've learned from other communities like Portland in particular, where they did a study where they asked members of the public, you know, how interested are you to ride your bike in an urban setting? Uh, and they, they came out with some studies that approximately 30% of people are not interested at all. Just They're just not going to do it. About 10% of people are like these guys, where they're what we call fit and fearless. They're out there, they're riding in traffic, they're very comfortable, they're confident riders. 60% of people fit into the category of interested but cautious. And for the most part, those folks, even if there's a bike lane on a busy arterial street, if it's right next to traffic, it doesn't feel very comfortable. And they may certainly not be comfortable out there with their young children riding a bicycle. So more uh, organizations, cities like Olympia are looking at how do we create more family-friendly bike facilities where it, uh, just a wider spectrum of the public is comfortable. So like riding on a trail or riding on a low volume, low speed street where bicycles and traffic can share the road. Or if it's on a busier street, uh, where there's some buffer or protection between traffic and where you are in your bike lane. So that's kind of increasingly where things are going. And um, yeah, because the hope is we get the 60% of folks that are interested but cautious out there doing it too. Yeah, that's our goal. Thank you. So uh, some people are old and they're not going to ride the bike. You know, they, they have to have a car. And, they're from a different generation anyway, you know, that probably never thought, you know, that of riding a bike, but, uh, you know, um, I, one thing that really bothers me, because I ride my bike every, everywhere, you know, and I have an electric bike, and it's 15 year old, years old now, but I can pack all this camera stuff on it, and I live in Seattle, I could go straight up Finney Ridge on that electric bike, you know. But, you know, uh, when I ride my bike and it's on a busy street, I make sure to leave space for people to go around me. And I see all these bike people that they're really, they get a certain set of, you know, really radical bike riders. Well, they're going to take up the whole street and they're going to make a whole line of traffic go 15 miles an hour. So that bothers me. Then another thing is that some people will go way around me to give me plenty of room. Other people will zoom past me at like 60 miles an hour, you know, and leave me that much space, you know. And so I wonder, you know, what you could, if they could maybe change regulations or something to, you know, make people treat each other better. Or <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure that I have an answer, a good answer for for the, the etiquette issue of how we treat each other on the, uh, when we're out there on the street. I do think one of the issues, though, that you raise a counterpoint is if you're actually riding in a lane on the street and there are cars parked alongside that lane, I don't want to ride in that right next to the cars. You never know when somebody's car door is going to open up right in front of you. So that kind of forces you already to the middle of the lane, at least, you know, in order to have three feet or so separation. So it's, it's, I don't think there's any real right answer to questions like that, but gosh. <laughs> there are, there are, uh, the middle of the lane with standard <laughs> yeah. official yeah. advice. There are, there are actually guidelines, and if anybody's interested, um, I have this handy little smart cycling quick guide um, with the three sticker attached for some of you, the lucky few anyway. Um, and this has a little bit of information about uh, lane positioning yeah, okay. um, for biking um, and what's legal and what's recommended. Um, you want the sticker? And for those who want uh, even more depth, 
There's the Washington State Bicycle Commute Guide, which has, I think, most of the laws in Washington State with regard to bicycle transportation. Um, so that's another tool that we have available to us. Um, that's also available online, I think, at WashDOT's website and a copy of the Thurston County Bike Map, which has some great tips and information and where to call in when you have an issue on the roads um, that you want to let the local government jurisdictions know about. So that's sort of a good segue to talking about um, my part in this presentation, if we want to move there to sure. this point, Duncan. Um, folks might have more questions about biking, bikeability, and, yeah. and that if, sort of if stuff. If you do about uh, spot lane positioning, I'm happy to share more about that, too. So um, at Public Health, we really want to make sure that these choices are available to people, active transportation, because it's been shown to be one of the main ways that people can get that daily dose of physical activity that is what prevents heart disease, diabetes, and a whole host of other chronic illnesses. And so there's been quite a bit of study in public health bases, its recommendations and decisions on scientific evidence. So um, we don't lightly go in and say, hey, this sounds like a good thing and we should support it. It's more like study to death in public health before it comes out as a recommendation. So um, what is the evidence behind what helps people walk more or supports more people in walking? Well, it boils down to the environment that we live in. Um, does that environment make the choice of being active or not easy for people? Does it support them in getting a daily dose of physical activity? So people who live in walkable neighborhoods are two times as likely to get physical activity as compared to those who don't. People in mixed-use neighborhoods, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment, um, are also more likely to, to meet physical activity guidelines. And people who live near a trail are even more likely to meet those guidelines. So having that supportive environment that makes it really easy for people to, to be physically active is proven to be more effective or an effective strategy towards it. It's not to say that, that you can't educate people to change their behaviors and inform them of all the benefits of walking and bicycling, but what we have substantiated in public health is that you change the environment and people will come. You change the environment and, and you'll get better results in terms of that level of physical activity. Another dimension of this is sort of the injury prevention, which I think relates to some of the questions here, how do we, how do we increase safety? Um, speed of traffic is the big factor in severity of crashes and resulting injuries from those crashes. So the more we can slow traffic down, and that can be accomplished through a variety of means, um, but generally in advocacy circles it comes down to cops or curbs. So um, you can either enforce your way into lower traffic speeds or you can make the environment guide people to those slower speeds by narrowing lanes and, and some other treatments that will you know, basically communicate to people through what they experience that they're supposed to go slower. You can put up all the speed limit signs you want, but that doesn't necessarily change behavior. Um, so a little bit more detail on what are the ingredients of that walkability um, that this scientific evidence is showing. It is density. It is trying to create compact developments where you have more people living in the same amount of space or the same area. Uh, this is an example of, a, of a, a neighborhood in Olympia where they've mixed an apartment building into what ordinarily in the past would have been a, a single family, um, fairly low density neighborhood. Um, but this is not far from transit and the city of Olympia said we're going to allow higher densities here and we're going to mix in some apartment buildings. Um, and of course um, do it in a way that also provides some infrastructure. Uh, diversity, that is that mix of uses that was referred to in that, that last slide. So when you can bring more destinations close to where people live or work, they're going to be more likely to go out to those places by the most convenient means, which if it's close by is on foot. If you've tried getting in your car to move from one place to another in downtown Olympia recently, or you've done this in a large city, you know how difficult and frustrating that can be to just get your car parked again. Um, so when we do this and we design things well and put those destinations close to where people live and work, they're going to be more apt to go for that walk to get to those activities and services that they want. 
And finally, the design. Of course, putting in place the, the needed infrastructure to um, make it possible for people who have a disability or through old age um, are not as mobile as they used to be to get around still, having ramps on curbs um, designed for, the, for, the, for all, uh, all ages and abilities. Um, making that an inviting environment by having lots of features, uh, street furniture, um, streetscape, um, ample walking space uh, with sidewalks, and dedicated facilities for bicycling and, and related uh, human power transportation. In the drawdown book that you heard referenced earlier today, um, they boil it down to four different characteristics here that we're trying to create a useful um, useful opportunities for people to be on foot or by bike or, or travel by bike, make them safe, make them comfortable, and make them interesting. So you want to try to achieve those four qualities through that density, diversity, and design. Um, and that really is what adds up to walkability. The book, I think, and some other uh, folks would, would include a couple other Ds besides those three Ds there. I just kind of simplified it for you folks. but. Um, Distance is another one that's frequently mentioned. I think that kind of gets covered by the density and the diversity when you're bringing those destinations closer to where people live and work. Yeah, that's going to make it easier for them to choose walking, biking. The distances aren't too great for them to get go there. Um, uh, I guess downpour would be another D um, that we have to deal with a lot in this climate. Um, but I think if you're out there on a regular basis, you realize that it's really not that great a proportion of the time, maybe certain months, yes, but it's not really that great a proportion of the time when it's really raining. There's, there's winter days when it's a steady drip, um, but you can, you, can, uh, you can overcome that with the right rain gear and, and similar equipment to keep yourself dry and comfortable. So some other design details, just having those dedicated facilities, as I mentioned, safe crossings, um, traffic calming that narrows the roadway and brings one side of the road closer to the other for the pedestrian. Uh, sometimes referred to as bulb outs or curb extensions. If you can help people just to cross one lane at a time, they're going to be less exposed to traffic. This also has the benefit of slowing traffic down. They, they come to something like this where it's a raised crossing uh, with curbs on either side of the lane that they're trying to go through and signs all over the place. They're going to they're going to naturally slow down a lot. And that's going to just reduce the risk for everyone that there's going to be any kind of collision. Another example of a, a good crossing treatment. If I'm a biker on those, though, I do worry a little bit because sometimes the bike lane disappears for mm -hmm. whatever you know distance it takes for that crosswalk plus the extra curvy and everything else. So yep, there is a certain amount of forcing well, into shared in lane lanes. Of, yeah that happens with some of these treatments. But I think the idea is that if you're slowing cars down to less than 20 miles per hour, um, a bike can more easily take the lane. Um, and in modern roundabouts, there's often a bypass provided where the cyclist can get up onto the curved area that's wider to accommodate both forms of, of active transportation, walking and biking. Um, so when you roll these things together, you end up with places, places that people want to be. Um, places that are inviting, that attract more and more walking and pedestrian and bicycle activity, and that encourages more people to do it. Um, and so it becomes kind of the culture. Um, and the lower left there is, of course, not in the United States, <laughs> um, as you might have guessed. Uh, Europe is far ahead of us in a lot of this because it was largely built at a time when walking was the primary form of transportation. You were lucky if you had a horse-drawn carriage or vehicle. Um, and so the, the urban environments that people find themselves in are very conducive to lots of walking and bicycling in, in those other countries. And we're in a situation where many U.S. cities were built at a time when the automobile was the new thing and was becoming a dominant mode of transportation. So it's going to take a long time to unwind that and bring us to a point where we do have a culture <laughs> that will support walking and bicycling and the environment to match that. Um, just some other evidence from public health points to these as being high leverage, high opportunity, high impact, 
kinds of interventions to do to support people's health. And you can see in there a couple of them are transportation related, and both of them are really act about active transportation. Safe routes to school programs uh, that encourage kids and families to walk and bicycle to school or, or utilize transit to school. And then pu the public transportation system is sort of a foundational element for a healthy community. Um, because these things are addressing disparities, they're making uh, healthy opportunities available to people from all walks of life. Uh, when we when we design for walkability and when we invest in our public transportation and uh, and do things to encourage more walking and bicycling, uh, I wanted to let you know a little bit about a, a group that's already formed here in the community that's advocating for this kind of change to our communities. And it's uh, part of that an overall public health improvement campaign called Thurston Thrives, which has now become a public-private partnership, um, but. We have an action team in community design, which is really focused on this built environment support for uh, walking, bicycling. Uh, so there is a strategy that's been developed over the last few years to accomplish that, and we're picking off things from this strategy. It includes things like encouraging local governments to, to make sure they have complete streets policies, and that those things are guiding their decisions about what they're building and how they're reviewing developments. Um, it includes uh, increasing trails and, and pathways because I think there's a huge uh, need for expanding and, and, and improving the availability of those off-street facilities. Mm -hmm. Building them as the only facility, as, as I think the question from Whidbey Island was getting at, is, is probably not a realistic strategy. And most people already live in built-out areas uh, that don't have uh, a multi-use or shared trail system through them. So connecting people to those uh, multi-use paths and trails and making them part of an overall multimodal transportation system that includes a lot of on-street facilities and, and other treatments like the bike corridors that City of Olympia is doing um, that do support the, the people that are interested but concerned and try to give them an option on lower stress streets. All that is part of the mix of how you create that network that's complete for walking and bicycling. Um, you want to really knit those things together because there's not one solution to, to fit every neighborhood or every part of a, of a city or county. Um, and of course, you know, a lot of other jurisdictions in our area point to City of Olympia that they don't want to be <laughs> just following the City of Olympia's footsteps. They want to be their own thing um, and have their own approach to accomplishing something like this. But what's what's encouraging is that most of the local governments do have long-range plans that state as goals that they want to become more walkable, they want to become more bikeable, they want to move in this direction of livable communities that, that do support active transportation. It's the how do we get there that is the, the tricky part. It requires some investment in retrofitting as well as making sure that you have the codes in place that new developments have to follow. Um, and that takes time to get those changes done to accomplish this. Um, as an action team, we've identified some key measures of progress that we're trying to follow in this. Um, we're looking at um, a, a sort of long-term measure of the proportion of housing that's being built near activity centers. And those of you who are at the Sustainable Thurston presentation from Thurston Regional Planning Council this morning probably heard a little bit about this uh, being one of their measures as well. So we tried to build on things that were already being looked at um, by uh, by, by the regional um, local governments here in Thurston County. Um, and that one's not moving. Uh, even with recent um, shift to downtown housing being built, um, I think some of the data is not yet caught up to that. I don't think we have 2018 data yet. Um, but it's pretty flat. We've set an ambitious target for that as a region over the next 20, 30 years to lift the proportion of all that development that is within a walking distance of an activity center, so it's more likely for people to go out and use active transportation to get to and from things they need, uh, of 72% we want. 72% of our, of our new housing to be built in proximity to those activity centers, and we're stuck at about 45% as a region. So a lot of work needs to be done to lift that up, and it's, it's been flat in the last five years. So. Um, Trail mileage is another key measure that we've picked. Um, and then looking at what are some of the ways that we can connect to that regional trail system through improvements like new access points and, and connecting 
um, ways for people. And of course, we're interested in public health and some long-term measures there that relate to physical activity and degree to which kids and families are participating in, in uh, walking and bicycling to school. Um, and there are some, you know, small improvements like creating benches out on the trails. That's something that uh, Olympia Safe Streets did some some work on last year. Um, basically, got some donations to encourage the county to build more benches along the regional trail system. Um, I have in my stuff some uh, images of before after some recent improvements to trail access that have been really uh, nice changes that are happening. And we've kind of done some analysis to support this, like where are the opportunities to build new access points to the trail system. Um, and this was a prime case of that where um, in a de high density, both residential and employment near Lily Road, um, there were very few access, public access points to the Chehalis Western Trail where a whole host of employees could be using their bike to get to and from work and residents there could be accessing that trail for daily walks um, and recreation and they were frustrated. They didn't have a, a clear way to do it that was public and accessible. Um, City of Olympia got some, some heat from the residents along there and, and some other advocacy groups and, uh, and responded by working with a landowner that was reluctant at first but then finally realized that they needed to do it um, because it was a lot of their residents who were asking them to, to build an improvement. So at the end of Ensign Road um, up in Northeast Olympia, the city recently constructed a, a new level accessible connection from the end of that street to the Chehalis Western Trail which opens it up for a whole bunch of apartment residents and the FERS yeah, uh, right. uh, assisted living facility. So, um, so some progress is being made and we hope to see continuation on projects like Safe Routes to School work that are happening as well as some you know, continued effort on the big picture policies like the comprehensive plan for Thurston County and a regional trails plan that TRPC is going to be working on an update for uh, in the next year or so. Um, I don't have time to get into a lot of this, but this is kind of getting at some of the question that Dad was asking about how do we get those policy changes to happen that will enable us to have the kind of walkable land use that we want um, because it seems like we're not getting there or we're not, we're not readily seeing that change happen. Um, it does take getting down into the, the deep devils that are in the details of things like the the um, design and development standards, engineering design and development standards in the city of Olympia, to make sure that they really are requiring that we build things to a very walkable design. Um, this is an example of that in Northeast Olympia. There's a development that's again adjacent to the Chehalis Western Trail that when it came in was not going to connect to that trail from the development, despite the fact that it was encompassing an area of several city blocks and was putting in new streets and would have several hundred residents moving in there, um, there weren't connections. But because of some local advocates who knew, knew the process, they were able to get in there and challenge this at the design review stage and make sure that the city was aware that they, you know, they're, not, they're not living up to the, the vision that we have in our comprehensive plan. We really ought to be requiring them to create block spacing that is small enough that people can walk to the trail and, and create the connections. So uh, through that advocacy, not only did they get this development to follow that, but they also were able to get that encoded in the development standards such that future developments will have to do this kind of connection. So that's just what this slide sort of unpacks a little bit. But that's the sort of getting into the details that really needs to happen on a regular basis. I think the city of Olympia is pretty far along in this. Um, but then there are the bigger policy questions of do we, are we supportive as a community of infill development um, and trying to create some incentives or, or encourage more density in existing neighborhoods. Um, and there's a lot of resistance to that, I think. What I'm most interested in politically is that most of the sort of progressive people that I know who are interested in land use are busy suing the city about the missing middle proposal about increasing density across the city. So that's very, I think that's important and interesting. And yeah. I, just, you know, I wonder whether you have thoughts about the dynamics of that, how, what, I thought maybe form-based zoning was going to solve 
provide an approach to sort of addressing some of those concerns and, and make it easier to do this. But and in some the city has passed that's passed by as far as I know. Yeah. And I and don't know in, in some areas, some districts, there's some experimentation going on with form based zoning that really says, you know, this is what the vision is for this area and we're gonna let things get built to that vision. Um, and not micromanage it, but really let it start to happen. Um, City of Lacey actually did that with the Woodland District near where the old uh, South Sound Center Mall is. And um, it's, it's something that is just starting to happen. Um, but again, there's a lot of that community backlash out there of people who don't really want their neighborhood to change very much. They're, they're all in favor of having things be livable and walkable, but when it gets down to would you be willing to have more duplexes or triplexes in your neighborhood, at least in close vicinity to those transit lines that run through your neighborhood, people are not necessarily on board with that. So I think that's kind of a cultural shift that we still need to, to work on and, and accomplish as a community is understanding the implications of that. Like if, if you keep the current level of density, we're never going to get there in terms of encouraging and supporting the things we say that we envision. <laughs> more people walking and bicycling for their transportation needs, increased transit services to make it possible to be not in the car. My grandchildren live in Ballard. So I've been up to Ballard once a week for the last eight years and have seen what's happened in Ballard, um, which is the, 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 the bugaboo that everybody appeals to. I think we do not want our neighborhood to <laughs> like Ballard. There is one lovely fourplex in my daughter's neighborhood that I think people would be happy to have. It was built in the 20s. It's a, it's a regular fourplex, but it fits with the neighborhood mm -hmm. in the way that all these new ticky-tacky boxes with various pieces of different veneers <laughs> stuck on the front do not really fit in the neighborhood. And so that's a good point, is that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to the design of something to make it very appealing and, and, and really insist on the, the oh, good. very good design that makes that density not so um, threatening or, or make people feel like they're not welcome anymore. <laughs> There's just a couple of quick comments. One is I bike a lot on the Shayless Western Trail too, and it's interesting. When those were first proposed to be put in, there was a lot of pushback from some of the people that live along the trail because they were worried about vandalism or trespass. A lot of those people have put gates in their and their fences now, so they can access the trail directly <laughs> from the back of their house. You know? right. I see that all along there. And the other comment is, I, I was up on the west side of Olympia last week, and it's worked on my car, and I walked to the mall, and the interesting thing about the mall is, there's sidewalks out on the street, but if you want to walk from the street to the mall, there is no pedestrian pathway whatsoever. You're walking in the lanes with the traffic. And it's like, well, that was built how many years ago? In the 60s, maybe? Yeah. So it's probably six-year-old thinking, but it's just, it was just fascinating to me to think about you know, how in, um, unappealing that is for anybody walking. Yeah. There's no safe place to walk if you're walking there until you actually get to the mall itself, when there's sidewalks around it, of course. But it's, it was fascinating to me that they, it was never required, obviously, and they never even thought it would be useful to put in <laughs> pedestrian pathways from the surrounding area into the mall. It's, it's a car-driven culture. It's actually newer. That, the, the mall on the west side was built. Eight. Was that that newer? Yeah, that new. Yeah. Um, Whenever we, yeah. They're, they're finally realizing that they need to have some kind of exterior walkway. I think they've got some kind of trail planned for a ring around the, the yeah. mall. I'm not sure how well it's going to connect yeah. from there into the. Well, yeah, the, the, main the buildings surrounding there. streets that have sidewalks, and then there's sort of nothing. Then there's the moat. Yeah. <laughs> of parking. Yeah. Are we? We're kind of. I think we we have so, come to the end of our time, but if folks right. want to ask more questions, I, I'm willing to hang out for a bit Just here. And there's just some final information on this slide about ways that you can stay involved with this, uh, participate in those active forms of transportation as much as you can personally because there is safety in numbers and this also encourages others to do that as well. Um, and then there's supporting or participating in events like the ones Duncan had listed on his slide, the Bicycle Commuter Challenge is coming up. And, uh, and then getting involved with some of those uh, devil in the detail things that I was alluding to um, and advocating for improvements to what local governments are, are doing and, and making our communities better. So yeah. feel free to take down some of that information and 
ask us questions and as we conclude. Thank you, guys. But thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I For, for the Bicycle Commuter Challenge and the other events uh, that are on the pieces of paper that I gave you, um, including a class that we're offering on uh, Bike Commuting Basics, where we will actually run you through the things you might need to know to get around safely and conveniently by bike. So um, I, I, I totally buy into the fact that we need to um, change the built environment to make it more bikeable and walkable. And on the other side of that is the more of us that use the environment the way it is and tell, um, you know, advocate, use our voices to make it better. Um, but actually being out there and showing ourselves on the road um, is a form of advocacy too. And um, so I, I encourage you to join me in that and uh, come and learn how to do it the best way you can and um, participate in our events in the Bike Commuter Challenge, the Earth Day Ride coming up um, in a week. Um, and I'm uh, also happy for any, any other questions. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah.